It is 9 p.m. in London and 3 p.m. at Fort Campbell in Kentucky. This is Press TV's World News. Many thanks for joining us this hour. Well, anti-government protests flare up in eastern Saudi Arabia. The protesters took to the streets of the city of Qatif. They chanted slogans against Bahrain's ruling Al Khalifa family in solidarity with the popular protests there. The demonstrators have been demanding the Saudi regime pull its forces out of Bahrain over the past weeks. The protests come despite a harsh Saudi crackdown on dissent in the kingdom. Riyadh has banned all protest rallies in the country. It has recently arrested scores of protesters and human rights activists. Human Rights Watch has urged all those arrested during anti-regime protests, including human rights activist Fadil al manasif to be released. In Bahrain, several protesters have been arrested as anti-regime rallies continue across the Persian Gulf. Sheikhton reports say a large number of protesters in the village of Akir have been detained by Saudi-led forces. This as protesters have taken to the streets across the country to condemn Saudi Arabia's deployment of more troops and tanks there. Bahrain has for several weeks been under a strict martial law imposed by the ruling Al Khalifa family. This in their bid to stifle the Bahrain revolution. Dozens of people have been killed and hundreds of others arrested in the brutal crackdown that started back in mid-February. Also, Talal Abdel Hamid, a member of the Opposition Islamic Action Association, has been arrested by Bahraini forces. Meanwhile, a prominent lawyer from the Human Rights Watch has been denied entry into Bahrain. The Bahraini regime says that Joshua Colangelo has been refused entry because of the kind of work he does. In Yemen, anti-government protesters have once again held mass rallies against the impaddled President Ali Abdullah Saleh. Well, the anti-government protesters have gathered at Change Square in the capital of Sana'a. Meanwhile, Saleh's supporters have also held a counter-rally in Sana'a. The president addressed his supporters, promising to resist what he called outlaws. Saleh said he would serve out his term as president until 2013. Yemen has been rocked by months of mass protests against Saleh. Security forces and pro-regime thugs have routinely attacked the demonstrators since the protests began. Over 150 people have been killed. Well, earlier we spoke to Professor Ahmad al-Abbasi of Sana'a University and he gave us more insight on the Yemen re revolution. The United States and the European Union they are still now with Saleh because they didn't even condemn, you know, the, the, the killings of hundreds of Yemenis until now. But now, you know, the opposition parties have succeeded in, you know, disclosing the, the, the personality of Ali Saleh as a deceiver, as a liar, as a killer. Because now, you know, for almost 10 days he has been, you know, arguing, he has been deceiving, he has been eluding, trying to escape from this uh, agreement. Many Yemenis know that he doesn't want, you know, uh, to transfer power peacefully. But the Yemenis are determined to uh, overthrow. He will uh, get out of the country uh, disgracefully. And uh, uh, people, you know, they, they will prefer death to, you know, uh, stay or live under the regime of Ali Saleh now. More um, uh, demonstrations, uh, more civil uh, disobedience will be there. Uh, so many things will be, you know, happen in the coming days to show that the, the, the people do not want Ali Saleh to stay in, in power. In Egypt, hundreds of people have held a protest against Israeli policies. The protesters gathered in front of the Israeli embassy, demanding the expulsion of Israeli ambassador from their country. The demonstrators also expressed their support for Palestinians. They called for immediate opening of Rafah border crossing into the Gaza Strip. Just a few days ago, Cairo announced a plan for permanently opening the border crossing with Gaza within days. Egypt has already warned Israel against interfering with its plan. Egyptian President Hosni Mubarak kept the crossing closed since Tel Aviv imposed a blockade on Gaza in 2007. 
Professor of International Law Marwan al Ashal tells us more about the Camp David Treaty between Israel and Egypt and the possibility of Cairo downgrading its ties with Tel Aviv. What has Egypt done is after uh, the decision of the International uh, Court of Justice uh, resolution has been issued uh, for the separation wall. Egypt has supported Israel with cement, uh, metal and steel, and gas. The Egyptian uh, administrative court has issued a decision that, it's, uh, that this action is called an act of a prince. I would think the coalitions would be based on just, uh, on just alliances, not on fake alliances. The fake alliance is the one that's been ongoing for the Mubarak rule, which was very unfair to the Egyptian economy and to the Egyptian role in the area. The alliance based on the peace treaty 1979 between Egypt and Israel. On this peace treaty, or the Camp David treaties, um, we are not mandated to take uh, the, the most measure of cooperation. There are 15 points on the graph that could be taken by the Egyptian government, starting with, the, with, uh, with reducing uh, the diplomatic uh, delegation and ends by cutting the diplomatic delegation. There is no reason to continue the deal with Israel at all. And the, uh, the U.S. aid to Egypt is actually uh, a big um, um, a joke. It's $3 billion, 1.9 military, military support. Uh, that, that is uh, very highly classified and confidential. Mubarak and the Ministry of Defense only are allowed to deal with it. And there's 1.1 million uh, billion, which are services and goods. Most of the financials say that we could live very well without the U.S. support. In Tunisia, one person has been killed after a police attacked anti-government protesters. The rallies have been in response to a warning by a former minister. He said the Assad president's loyalists would mount a coup if who he called Islamists win the ballot in election set for July the 23rd. Our correspondent Amin al-Khatib in Tunis tells us more. Uh, the people were starting to gather at around 11 o'clock and there was a few hundred of them um, and they managed to gather in a central city in a center of Tunis when they were setting off towards the Ministry of Interior um, it was initially a peaceful protest uh, all the people were asking for was for the uh, removal of the current system of the Ministry of Interior and they were asking for, uh, for changes in the government because they believe the old system is still persistent in the current interim government. This, was, um, this basically uh, led towards some uh, conflict with the police. Uh, uh, most witnesses have told me that uh, the police uh, had begun by shooting gas canisters into the crowd and immediately after that they began to chase the protesters into the, uh, uh, around the Bourguiba area with sticks and batons. In many instances, we have footage where people were hit in the head, they were hit on the hand, arms, on the legs, and so on. Uh, serious injuries were caused. In fact, one of our cameramen was hit uh, a couple of times on the back with the batons while holding a camera, and a gas canister was released near where I was, near uh, with the cameraman also, and we were directly affected. Even though we were calling that we were pressed, we were pressed. The police uh, still intended on chasing us, and uh, we managed to escape with uh, the tape and the footage which they were trying to obtain from us at the same time. Russia and China have been discussing the right response to the developments in the Middle East and North Africa. The Arab world revolutions dominated talks between Russian officials and Chinese Foreign Minister Yang Jiechi, who is on an official visit to Moscow. Our correspondent our reports on that from Moscow. Russia and China are concerned about the situation in the Middle East and North Africa and will tighten cooperation in the region. The two countries' foreign ministers made the decision during talks in Moscow. We have agreed to coordinate our actions using the abilities of both states to assist the early stabilization and prevent further negative unpredictable consequences there. The Russian minister says Moscow and Beijing believe every nation should decide its future independently, without outside interference. Sergei Lavrov condemned the idea of a ground military operation in Libya, after reports claiming NATO allies were preparing for it. 
Resolution 1973, adopted by the UN Security Council, straight and unequivocally rules out such a possibility, and this position of Russia remains unchanged. China's foreign minister spoke against meddling in Middle Eastern countries and called for a hold of hostilities in Libya. Task number one is to achieve an immediate ceasefire by all the parties involved in order to stop the situation from worsening and avert a greater humanitarian catastrophe. NATO allies have conducted airstrikes on Libya since March 19th after a UN Security Council resolution called for a no-fly zone there. Muammar Gaddafi's youngest son and three of his grandchildren were killed in strikes. Russia questioned NATO's assurances that airstrikes are not targeting the Libyan leader. We see the whole operation is aimed at eliminating Gaddafi, not just removing him from power. The George Bush administration had a similar aim of capturing Saddam Hussein when invading Iraq. So I do not rule out this scenario exists. Young Jay Chur also met Russian President Dmitry Medvedev. Talks focused on relations between the two states and urgent international issues, including North Korea's nuclear program. Talks also covered preparation for the upcoming visit of Chinese leader Hu Jintao to Russia and the two leaders' participation in the Shanghai Cooperation Organization Summit in Kazakhstan next month. Svetlana Tikhamirova, Press TV, Moscow. In Syria, at least 26 people have reportedly lost their lives in fresh clashes in several cities. State media sources say a Syrian soldier and four security forces were shot dead in homes. They say unknown armed gangs targeted the forces. Activists have reported that 21 protesters were killed in homes in Hama. Clashes erupted following pro-reform demos across the country on a day demonstrators dubbed the Day of Defiance. Meanwhile, Syrian army has pulled out its armor uh, out of that up. The army had deployed its tanks in some city districts over a week ago. The opposition accuses the security forces of being behind the killings, but the government blames armed gangs for the deadly violence. Hundreds of people in the Azerbaijan Republic have gathered outside the Education Ministry in the capital Baku to protest the government's hijab ban in schools. The protesters demanded the resignation of the country's Education Minister, Mr. Mardanov, over banning girls with headscarves from attending classes. They also called for reversing the order, saying it's a female's constitutional right to wear a headscarf at school. The demonstration turned violent after police beat protesters. Protesters retaliated by throwing stones. Reports say several people were injured and more than a dozen were detained following the clashes. Well, you're watching World News here on Press TV. It's time for a quick reminder of the headlines this hour. Hundreds of people in Saudi Arabia protest against their country's military intervention in Bahrain. Several protesters are arrested in Bahrain as anti-government rallies continue across the Persian Gulf Sheikhdom. Hundreds of Egyptians protest against the Israeli ambassador's presence in their country. Dozens of people are reportedly killed in anti-government protests in Syria. In Azerbaijan, hundreds of people protest against the government's ban on hijab in schools. Thank you.